Okay, so in the year 2013, the Seattle Seahawks organization accomplished the impossible. After building a contender from the ground up in just four short years, Seattle had accumulated a young core that even without Super Bowl experience, had just embarrassed the number one offense in NFL history on the biggest stage possible, taking home a shiny Lombardi trophy. And with this Super Bowl victory, everybody Everybody and their pet goldfish believed this trophy would only be the first of many, and for the remainder of the 2010s decade at least, every other NFL team would merely live under the suffocating shadow that was the Seattle Seahawks. Well, uh, that didn't happen, so let's get right into the video and allow me to tell you a story. A story of internal conflict, bad luck, chemistry issues, some weird-ass situations with other teammates' wives, and a certain play that ruined everything. So you know the drill, by the end of this video you'll be able to understand what went wrong with the potential Seahawks dynasty, but for now we gotta start all the way in the beginning and go way back to the 2009 NFL season. In 2009, the Seattle Seahawks organization was just in shambles and was nothing short of a hot mess. Previously, Seattle had success in the early 2000s with head coach Mike Holmgren and MVP running back Sean Alexander, as the team even reached a super and arguably should have won it, but now both of these men were gone, and the Seahawks were in desperate need of a full culture change. And well, I guess they tried to bring in a culture, as the Seahawks hired former Falcons head coach Jim Mora Jr. to be their new captain of the ship, and Seattle also selected the top-ranked linebacker in the 2009 NFL Draft in Aaron Curry, fourth overall to help ring in this brand new Seahawks culture. Also, to show their shiny new rookie just how much they appreciated him, they handed Aaron Curry a six-year, $60 million contract with $34 million guaranteed before he even touched a singular blade of NFL grass. Shockingly, this didn't go well at all, as Jim Mora was just a plain moron and Aaron Curry couldn't care less after getting that gargantuan contract. To put it lightly, the 2009 season was just a disaster for the Seahawks on every level. I mean, the most relevant thing that happened to them all year was probably when the Seahawks rolled out their action green jerseys for one game, only to have them retired forever immediately afterwards. So after this dumpster fire of a campaign, the Seahawks once more needed a culture change, and prior to the 2010 season, they got exactly that and so much more. So please, allow me to introduce you to the two protagonists of this story, General Manager John Schneider and Head Coach Pete Carroll. Just eight days after the Seahawks' last game of the 09 season, the organization completely washed their hands of Jim Morris' tenure, throwing his lifeless body to the wolves as they hired USC Trojans coach and running back whisperer Pete Carroll. Then just eight days later, they fired their president slash general manager Tim Ruskell and replaced him with John Schneider. So the Seahawks now had two very important men now in charge, but at this point they had no time to waste because Arguably the most pivotal point in Seahawks history would be coming up in the 2010 NFL Draft. And what did the Seahawks first draft under their new dynamic duo look like? Well, it looked, it looked pretty damn good. In the first six selections, the Seahawks in the 2010 NFL Draft picked up five guys, uh, four and a half if you want to nitpick, but almost five players who would play very important roles for this Seattle team for the next few years. But beyond that, this draft contained two Pro Bowl talent level guys in Russell Okun and Golden Tate, which is already an insane draft on its own. But then you add on the fact that Seattle picked up two potential Hall of famers in Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor, and that's when this draft class becomes something of legend. So the 2010 season would begin, and through the first four weeks, things were looking a little rocky, as the Seahawks went 2-2 two and two during this time period, suffering two embarrassing losses to some really not great football teams. So with that context, remember how I said that Pete Carroll was something of a running back whisperer? Well, at this point in the Seahawks season, it was clear they were in desperate need of a spark plug, and what they got was, 
uh, well, a beast mode. On October 5th, 2010, the Seattle Seahawks sent a few measly draft picks to the Buffalo Bills, and in exchange, Santa Claus dropped off a singular Marshawn Lynch, a player who would arguably become the most important piece of the Seahawks' potential dynasty. But even with that eerie foreshadowing, with Marshawn now in a darker blue uniform, not too much changed, as entering the final week of the regular season, the Seahawks stood with a measly 6-9 record, but somehow actually had a chance to make the playoffs. In Week 17, the Seahawks would get a chance at redemption against the St. Louis Rams, and with both teams coming into the game with a record of sub-500, whoever won this game would move into the the playoffs as basically the new worst playoff team of all time. And after a thrilling game that contained field goal after field goal after field goal after field goal after field goal, after field goal it, it was over. The Seahawks won the game and the division, becoming at the time the worst divisional champion record-wise in a non-strike shortened season. So the Seahawks made the playoffs, but waiting for them was the football equivalent of a death sentence, as the reigning Super Bowl champion New Orleans Saints basically came into the game carrying a bloody axe while wearing a vintage executioner's mask. I'm not lying. Going into this game, not one soul was giving the Seahawks a chance except for the Seahawks themselves, as Pete Carroll had basically said he was confident his team would win the game. But like, okay, dude, seriously? You think your garbage ass 7-9 team can win? Uh, not only was Pete Carroll correct in his assessment, but nobody could have possibly predicted what would happen in this very game. Oh, look at this run! What a run! It is a shocker. No other way to say it. The Seattle Seahawks shocked the NFL world emotionally and literally, as Marshawn Lynch basically iced the game with the Beast Quake run. In my opinion, the best run in NFL history. A run so loud that a device used to measure literal volcanoes and earthquakes was able to pick up on the noise produced from the Seahawks crowd alone. And the run itself was just special, as Marshawn was shaking off and tossing full-grown men like stuffed animals and finished off the play by telling the whole Saints defense to take a whole handful of his nutsack. Just incredible. So although the Seahawks would go on to lose in the divisional round versus future Hall of Famer Jay Cutler and the Bears, this season was still an irreplaceable cornerstone for the future of Seattle. Although all the talent they added was awesome, Pete Carroll had built a culture that proved to work in just one season. A culture that oozed swag and grit, and the only thing left to do was keep adding more weapons to both sides of the ball. So with that, we enter the 2000 2011 NFL draft, a draft where this time they didn't have a super high draft pick, so it would be way harder to add all-time great talent like they did last year, uh, right? They did it again. So somehow, with no second round pick and a late first, John Schneider and Pete Carroll rubbed their crystal ball and found five more guys who would turn out to be very important pieces for the future. And just like the last draft, they casually picked up another Hall of Fame lock in the fifth round, picking up former college wide receiver Richard Sherman. Uh, you may have heard of him. And this isn't even counting Doug Baldwin, a wide receiver who will later be an irreplaceable asset for Seattle, who went undrafted in this very year. Now, the 2011 season would begin, and although the team was clearly doing a great job developing young talent, the season was still relatively similar to last year in all the worst ways, as the team started off slow with some humiliating losses only to pick it up in December and end the season at 7-9 and nine for the second season in a row, but this time they missed out on the playoffs. So with the season concluded, the Seahawks obviously had a lot of problems to address, but above all, their biggest was the 
the quarterback position, as their guy for the majority of the 2011 season was Tavares Jackson, who was okay, I guess, but unfortunately, it very quickly became clear that he was not going to be the guy in Seattle going forward. So going into the 2012 offseason, John Schneider made it a priority to come into the next season with a new starting quarterback to lead the Seahawks' new core into the future. And although the original plan to lure Peyton Manning away into the city of Seattle was a complete failure, they now had a solid plan B in the works. And this plan B would be for Seattle to go out of their way and sign legendary Packers quarterback uh, uh, Matt Flynn to a three-year $20 million contract. Now, if you don't know who Matt Flynn is, I can't blame you even a little bit because uh, Matt Flynn was, how do I say this, bad. Like, r really bad. Literally after doing almost nothing in the NFL for his entire career, in the final game of the 2011 season, Matt Flynn took the field for the 15-1 Green Bay Packers, who had nothing to play for, and I, I, I don't know how he did this, but he dropped one of the best stat lines in NFL history, as the Packers beat the Lions in a completely meaningless shootout. <sighs> so after... One good performance, the Seahawks now had their quarterback for the next three years. Hooray. This was already a pretty questionable decision, and even in hindsight, Matt Flynn himself was stumped as to why anyone would want him on their football team. So now the Seahawks had their quarterback, and they moved into the 2012 NFL Draft with mediocre picks at best. So uh, th there was no way that they would walk away from this draft with more gold. I mean, they've done it the last two years, so a third year in a row would just be completely unbelievable on every... This time, they got five dudes who would be very real NFL players for Seattle in the future, and because why the hell not, they picked up arguably the best linebacker since Ray Lewis in this draft with Bobby Wagner. But I'm forgetting one guy from this draft class, and uh, I think this is where the luck aspect begins to kick in just a little bit. Although Seattle seemed content with Matt Flynn at quarterback, the Seahawks decided to use their third round pick on Wisconsin quarterback Russell Wilson hoping to give Matt Flynn at least a little friendly competition to start training camp. So this pick looked cute on the surface from Seattle's perspective, but little did they know, Russell Wilson would change everything for the Seahawks, and he would turn this up-and-coming team into an apex predator much sooner than anyone could have possibly anticipated. But for now, going into the 2012 season, the offseason was headlined by the ruthless quarterback battle between Russell Wilson, Matt Flynn, and I guess Tavares Jackson too, but he really didn't matter. The battle was really just between Matt and Russ, as both quarterbacks had been impressing Pete Carroll and others tremendously as nobody really had any clue as to who the starting quarterback would be come week one. All offseason, and long, it was a ruthless battle, and Pete Carroll's cutthroat culture of sheer competition was in full effect. And shockingly, after the flames had settled and the war had ended, Russell Wilson, the third round rookie, had beaten out Matt Flynn for the starting quarterback job in week one. This was huge, because pretty much every other team in the NFL would have just given the job to Matt Flynn anyways because of the money alone. But the Seahawks culture worked differently, and made it clear that no matter who you were, your job was never going to be safe from the guy behind you. But before the season would begin, for namesake, while doing a radio interview to try and find a nickname for the Seahawks secondary, Cam Chancellor, with the help of fans, settled on the nickname The Legion of Boom, a name that would later strike fear in the hearts of offensive players everywhere. So expect to hear that phrase a hell of a lot more later on. Anyway, the new look Seattle Seahawks would begin the 2012 regular season, and straight away, we got to see this team's character shine in the biggest moments. There were some great moments, like the iconic fail Mary that led to a win in Green Bay, and even better, in week six, the Seahawks came from behind to beat the Patriots, and after the game, we got a Hall of Fame tweet from Richard Sherman, dropping the classic line, 
you mad bro in the face of Tom Brady. But although all of this was great on paper, through the first 12 weeks of the season, the Seahawks were still nothing special, as after a tough loss to the Dolphins, the Seahawks sat at just 12th overall on that week's NFL power rankings. And even worse, during this time, the Seahawks ended up getting caught up in their very first scandal, as after their week 12 loss to Miami, both of their star corners, Brandon Browner and Richard Sherman, would face suspensions for PED drug use. Pretty much the last thing the Seahawks needed. And although Richard Sherman would win his appeal, Brandon Browner, probably the better player at the time, would end up serving a four-game suspension. But somehow, that really didn't matter, because the rest of December would happen, and the Seahawks caught fire. The Seattle Seahawks won their remaining five games left in the 2012 season, and did so in beyond dominating fashion, dropping a 58-0 shutout on the Arizona Cardinals, and maybe even more impressively, ripped apart their greatest rival in the 49ers limb from limb, beating them 42-13 as Russell Wilson played one of the most efficient games a quarterback can have. And speaking of Russell Wilson, he was downright ludicrous this season, as he made the Pro Bowl in just his rookie season. And even scarier, the players around him were better than him, as both Earl Thomas, Richard Sherman, and Marshawn Lynch all made all pro teams, having legitimate cases as top three players at their respective positions. So because of that tear at the end of the season, the Seahawks found themselves in the playoffs, and Russell Wilson would face off against his fellow rookie who had pretty much somehow been better than him this season, as the Seahawks would face off against the Offensive Rookie of the Year in the dynamic Robert Griffin III and the rest of his fearsome Washington team. Well, if this were an RG3 video, I would spend like 10 minutes on this game, but it's not, and unfortunately RG3's career would basically end when his knee buckled on him when he shouldn't have even been in the game, and the Seahawks were able to escape Washington off of the back of some dude who likes Skittles. With this game, Seattle had now racked up their second playoff win under Pete Carroll, and although this win ended with Richard Sherman getting socked by Trent Williams, the Seahawks wouldn't have wanted it any other way. The defense was smothering teams, and with Richard Sherman as the mouth of the defense, they pissed off opponents too, as they started to create a little bit of a reputation for knocking guys the hell out and then trash-talking them as they limp their way back to the huddle. So to say the least, the Legion of Boom was very intimidating. Now, although Seattle did win the game, it still came at a hefty price, as Seattle lost a very solid contributor who would be greatly missed in their next game, as their sack leader in defensive end, Chris Clemens, would tear his ACL, ending his season. But going into their divisional round matchup with the Falcons, people were skeptical if that vaunted, hyped-up Legion of Boom defense would translate into real playoff football or not, as the Falcons were 13-3 on the year, and led by a lethal trio of Julio Jones, Roddy White, and Tony Gonzalez, this team looked unstoppable and proved it all year long. And early on, it looked like the Falcons were just the superior bird or something, as they pretty much ended the game taking a 27-7 lead late in the third quarter. So, with 30 seconds left in the fourth quarter, with the Seahawks holding a one-point lead, it now looked like Seattle was finally on their way towards an NFC Championship appearance. But it just wasn't meant to be, as when it mattered most, the Seahawks' defense buckled as they gave up two massive completions, including a 19-yarder to Tony Gonzalez to set up a game-winning field goal by Atlanta. But don't let this loss distract you from the fact that this Seahawks team basically went neck and neck with with a team that was arguably considered the best in the entire NFL, and when it mattered most, Seattle's defense was able to stifle the Falcons' offense, stopping Atlanta on three straight drives, giving Russell Wilson and the offense a chance to get back into the game. So to every viewer of NFL football around this time, it was 100% clear that this Seahawks team was on the cusp of greatness, but going into 2013, uh, greatness would still be a vast understatement.
The Seattle Seahawks had become the most feared team in the NFL, and just four years removed from 2009, the Seahawks now found themselves dominating the regular season going 13-3, and sporting one of the best offenses in the league, and more impressively, one of the best defenses in league history. I, I can't even begin to explain how dominant this defense was this year, so I guess just pause this video if you really want to take in all these stats, but uh, I guess all you really need to know is that these four guys alone have a very strong case as the greatest secondary in NFL history. And that was just the secondary. We still have every other defensive position to get to. The linebacker core was loaded with Bobby Wagner, KJ Wright, and Malcolm Smith, while you had pass rushing specialists in Michael Bennett, Bruce Irvin, and Cliff Averill causing havoc right down the center of the paint for the defense. So the defense was all right, and then on offense, Russell Wilson was coming into his own as unanimously a top seven quarterback in the NFL at least, with Marshawn Lynch still maintaining his role as the heartbeat of the team, along with Golden Tate and Doug Baldwin leading the team in the receiving department, and that is how you get an all-time great team. Once again, in just four years, Pete Carroll and John Schneider built this team from nothing, and were more than ready to just sit back and watch the Seahawks bulldoze through the regular season. So like I said before, the Seahawks went 13-3 and on the entire season, and basically had a full chokehold on the number one spot in the power rankings every single week of the season since week one. So although all that regular season stuff is cool, it doesn't really matter in the playoffs. And if you're going to be the top dog in the NFL, you're going to have to prove to the rest of the league that you deserve respect. And the first trial the Seahawks had to face would be a familiar opponent. Drew Brees and the Saints remembered what had happened just three years prior, and although this was a totally different core, that didn't matter. Either Drew Brees was walking out of that stadium with a win, or he was walking out with one less body part than before. Well, unfortunately for Drew Brees, he didn't know what he was going against at all, as the Legion of Boom just nullified the Saints' offense for almost the entire game, as they held the Saints completely scoring through three whole quarters, and despite a poor Russell Wilson performance, the game was never even close. So after removing Drew Brees' pancreas, their next trial was their hated rival in the San Francisco 49ers. To say the least, these teams weren't super friendly with one another, and you know, I may go as far as to say they just plain didn't like each other. And to add more wood to the fire, the 49ers had been hyped up as the only defense in the league that could potentially keep up with the Seahawks Legion of Boom. So the stage was set and lit beautifully as we got a perfect matchup between the two best teams in the NFC and what we got was nothing short of a gridiron classic. Please, if you haven't seen the highlights for this game, just watch it. I mean, I can't explain it here, but it seemed like every single yard in this game had to be earned, and unless some tomfoolery was going down, each team wasn't gaining more than 10 yards on any given play. But like I said, the Seahawks just pulled off a little bit more tomfoolery than the 49ers, as they got a massive Jermaine Curse touchdown on fourth down to keep the game close, then they got a little lucky as Navarro Bowman's leg just snapped when he recovered a fumble that ended up not even being a fumble for the 49ers. But although those plays were cool for Seattle, this team had one identity, and that was punishing defense. So of course, probably the Seahawks' best franchise play would happen in this game, in this moment, by their best player. So uh, 49ers fans, you know the drill. You should look away right now. Richard Sherman tips the ball into the hands of Malcolm Smith to end the 49ers' hopes and dreams of returning to the Super Bowl, and the Seahawks, led by Pete Carroll, were going to their first Super Bowl since the 2005 season. Now, I hate to kill the mood here, but I have to bring this up. Uh, as a team who held egos in very high regard, there would inevitably be some internal conflicts that would come to light, as before the Super Bowl would take place, Golden Tate felt the need 
need to just start torching his newly acquired teammate Percy Harvin by basically saying the team didn't need him at all, so Percy responded by punching the man in the face and possibly throwing him in a trash can. Uh, okay then. Just so you know, this will not be the last time we talk about Golden Tate's, uh, antics. Regardless of this little setback, the stage was set, as the Seattle Seahawks would face off against the Denver Broncos in Super Bowl 48, the best defense in recent NFL history versus the best offense in recent NFL history. It was a perfect narrative, and that would surely make for a perfect Super Bowl. And you know, I guess for one fan base, it was a perfect Super Bowl, as the Denver Broncos got smeared against the turf for 60 minutes straight as the Seahawks embarrassed Peyton Manning and the Broncos in front of the entire country. This game was just a masterclass of defense at the highest level, as three players on Seattle had double-digit combined tackles as the defense forced four turnovers on the MVP of the league, while only allowing a single touchdown to an offense that averaged an unreal 37.9 points per game that season. So they had done it. The Seattle Seahawks, led by John Schneider and Pete Carroll, had built a Super Bowl winner with an offense led by a third round pick an undrafted wide receiver and a running back they traded for, and a defense built mainly of undervalued picks, the Seattle Seahawks had become the top candidate for the next dynasty of the NFL. And don't just take my word for it, literally everyone around this time period was in full belief that the Seattle Seahawks were going to be running the NFL for the next 63 years at least. I mean, hell, even the 49ers were starting to admit that they might just be screwed too along with the NFL as long as Seattle doesn't mess anything up in the future. So we move into the 2014 regular season where, just like any successful team, the Seahawks had a salary cap problem, and they basically could choose between either their pass rush specialist in Michael Bennett or Golden Tate, and the decision they made was one that would send ripple effects throughout the future of this organization. I'm not saying it was the wrong one, but it was definitely a costly decision, as the Seahawks decided to bring back Michael Bennett on a four-year, $28.5 million contract, meaning Golden Tate as well as cornerback Brandon Browner were both free to walk, but in Golden Tate's case, we gotta ask, why did the front office make this choice? Well, it was rumored that maybe that little kerfuffle before the Super Bowl played into this decision by Seattle's front office at least a little bit, and maybe add that on to a rumor that we'll get into later, uh, the Seattle Seahawks decided they just didn't want to deal with Golden Tate anymore, and he agreed to a new massive contract with the Lions. But to start the 2014 season, the Seahawks were seriously struggling, as through almost the halfway point in the season in Week 7, the Seahawks found themselves at just three and three, and at this point, without Golden Tate, it was clear their biggest weakness was their lackluster receiving core. Not only had the Seahawks lost Golden Tate in the offseason, as mentioned, but Percy Harvin, the other half of the skirmish a while ago, was dealt to the Jets after just four games in the season, so the already thin receiving core got even thinner. But even worse, while Percy Harvin was still on Seattle, he allegedly created a massive locker room divide, with some players celebrating the fact that he was now gone, and others like Marshawn Lynch straight up refusing to get on the team bus after Percy Harvin was traded in protest. So like I said, this team had some, uh, s some characters. I mean, the receiving room was such a problem that at one point, Pete Carroll seriously considered having Richard Sherman play both sides of the ball. Not exactly the reports you want to be hearing from a reigning Super Bowl champion. But I guess maybe Percy Harvin was the problem, as after the trade, the Seahawks went right back to being the scariest, meanest team in the entire NFL, as after Week 7, the Seahawks only lost one game on the entire season, and went right back to being the consensus favorites to win the Super Bowl. And of course, during this time period, the Seahawks had no shortage of signature wins, as they had games like a Thanksgiving massacre over the 49ers that was so humiliating that 49ers CEO Jed York felt it was necessary to apologize for the performance to the entire country. So the Seahawks trash-talked and ball-sack grabbed their way to the playoffs, where they dispatched of a losing record Carolina Panthers team in the divisional round, and once more faced 
pretty much the strongest opponent you possibly could face. The Green Bay Packers had managed to keep pace with the Seahawks all year long, and led by the MVP of the league in Aaron Rodgers, there was serious belief that the Packers could and will take down the Seattle Seahawks. And if you're gonna become a dynasty, you can't duck any smoke. And the Seahawks went into this challenge head first, and once more, we got another Gridiron Classic. But wait, before we get into the game, remember that Golden Tate rumor I was talking about earlier? Well, uh, just before the Seahawks were set to take on the Packers in the conference championship game, for some goddamn reason, Golden Tate just started addressing some wild conspiracy theory denying that he never slept with Russell Wilson's ex-wife. Th this was not a mainstream rumor at all, and the only person to stoke this fire was Golden Tate himself, which led many people to believe there was a lot more bad blood behind closed doors in Seattle than initially thought, uh, something we'll go more in depth on later. Anyways, back on track, as the game between the Seahawks and the Packers began, it looked like Golden Tate's attempts to get into Russell Wilson's head were working perfectly, as Russ was playing horribly, and these were his stats to end the game, but before the end of the fourth quarter, it was looking way, way worse than this. The Packers just looked like the better team, playing efficient football, jumping out to an early 13-0 lead in the first quarter, and even more impressively, they managed to hold Seattle to zero points in the entire first half. But throughout the game, although the Packers had a massive lead, Green Bay had been getting almost exclusively field goals, making conservative play call one after the other, and as the game went on, the efficiency dwindled and the Seahawks finally got a touchdown late in the fourth quarter. But with only one timeout, it really didn't matter. The game was still mathematically over on... <sighs> I hate doing this, I really do, but Packers fans, uh, may I ask you to exit the room and on your way back in, maybe grab a warm bottle of bleach or something. In just a matter of a few minutes, a series of unfathomably unlucky plays happened back to back to back, and just like that, the Green Bay Packers had collapsed completely, blowing an almost 100% chance to win the game, and the Seattle Seahawks dynasty continued to stay on track as they found themselves back in the Super Bowl. Super Bowl 49, the game that would be the Seahawks' final test in becoming a dynasty. And who would be waiting on the other side of the field for them? None other than the final boss of the 2010s, the New England Patriots led by Bill Belichick and Thomas Brady. So with two teams given a fair chance to become the next dynasty, Wilson vs. Brady, Belichick vs. Carroll, Sherman vs. Revis, the storylines were just perfect. And what resulted is possibly the greatest game of football ever played. The game was a perfect heavyweight fight between two rabid dogs, as both teams went scoreless in the first quarter and matched each other blow for blow with two touchdowns each in the second quarter. So although the Seahawks would pull away by 10 late in the game, it didn't really matter because Tom Brady did Tom Brady stuff, and the Patriots now held a four-point lead with two minutes left in the fourth quarter. Both of these champions were obviously wounded, but with two minutes on the clock and a dream, the the Seattle Seahawks had a chance to cement themselves as a dynasty and prove that they, not the Patriots, were the team of the future. Immediately, Russell Wilson found Marshawn Lynch for a huge 31-yarder, and then after picking up a crucial third down, it happened. In one of the luckiest plays in NFL history, Russell Wilson threw a pass up to Jermaine Curse, and after the ball bounced off of himself, he caught it on the rebound to set Seattle up on the five-yard line. Marshawn Lynch then ran the ball down to the one-yard line, teasing Seahawks fans everywhere, 
for what was to come. The dynasty in Seattle was on its way, and it was so close their fan base could almost taste it, and all Tom Brady could do was watch from the sidelines in horror as Marshawn Lynch would inevitably take a one-yard run into the end zone and get a game-winning touchdown. Armageddon. The dynasty was now in shambles. After one singular play, everything the Seahawks had been building over the last five years froze in time. And although we may not have known it at the time, the Patriots, not Seattle, would become the new dynasty for the future as the Seahawks would begin a downward spiral filled with rumors and lies that would bring their inevitable downfall. But hey, going into 2015, maybe the Seahawks could be poised for a bounce back year and they could get right back on track into being the next dynasty, as it could be argued that on paper, this Seahawks team was better than any team they had fielded prior, as they brought in guys like Jimmy Graham and Thomas Rawls, who would certainly help bring some much needed beef to the offense. But once again, early in the season, the Seahawks struggled mightily, as through week six, the Seahawks found themselves with a very underwhelming and disappointing 2-4 record, but this time, the problems of this team were much larger than just one player. This Seahawks team was riddled with holes, as their O-line was trash, and Jimmy Graham, their newly acquired tight end, was already pissed with how he was handled on offense, which wasn't great, but the main issue with the 2015 Seahawks was, believe it or not, their defense, as through the first couple of games, they looked like a shell of their former selves. A lot of the blame for the Seahawks' struggles early on was put on Camp Chancellor, who was holding out for a new contract but most people weren't really worried about the Seahawks because come December, the Seahawks should be totally fine, right? Well, yeah, that was pretty much true, as Seahawks December football was in full effect as Seattle dropped 30 points in six out of their last seven games and came into the playoffs with a ton of momentum and the defense was starting to look like their old self once more. But what should be mentioned from this regular season for storytelling reasons is that back in week eight against the Dallas Cowboys, there was an absolutely tragic injury when in a sick, twisted form of symbolism, Seahawks wide receiver Ricardo Lockett suffered a gross, career-ending neck injury. Ricardo Lockett, the same wide receiver on the wrong end of the interception to lose the Super Bowl, had to fall on the sword of Seattle's sins, and the end of his career, as you'll see, will end up being a sad, sad allegory for Seattle's downfall as a whole. Anyways, standing in their way of getting back to the glory they were at last year was the Minnesota Vikings in the wildcard round, a team led by all-pro running back Adrian Peterson and Teddy Bridgewater. Basically, they were going to be no pushover. Add that on to the fact that this game was set up to be one of the coldest in NFL history, and the Seahawks would be without Marshawn Lynch, breakout rookie running back Thomas Rawls, and Jimmy Graham, and it was clear things were not looking good for the Seahawks. So, the game began, and predictably, it was sloppy, with offense being very hard to come by, but at home, the Vikings had an advantage and seemed poised to knock the Seahawks out of the playoffs in just the first round, bringing a end to the dynasty way earlier than anyone could have possibly predicted. And yeah, it looked over for the Seahawks as they watched as Teddy Bridgewater picked apart Seattle's once legendary defense to set up a 27-yard field goal to end Seattle's season. Snap good, spot down, Walters kick is up, and it is no good, he missed it! Are you kidding me? I, uh, yeah, you, you know how it is at this point. Anyway, after dodging a bullet, the Seahawks would run into the unstoppable force that was the Carolina Panthers, and although the score looked close, the Panthers pretty much just jumped out to a 31-0 lead early on in the game and coasted from there. As led by their MVP, Cam Newton, they went out and proved that they, not the Seahawks, were the NFC's best team. And not only did the Panthers win the game, knocking the Seahawks out of the playoffs in the process, but they humiliated. Russell Wilson as well, as they took his first pass attempt straight back to the house, and throughout the game, they basically made fun of the man's wife every time he was sacked. 
Now, Russell Wilson wasn't doing a great job of protecting his image on his own, but uh, we'll get more into that later. So just like that, the Seahawks' downfall was now well more than underway, and in the offseason, the first major domino would fall when the heartbeat of the Seahawks' Marshawn Lynch announced his official retirement, creating an unpatchable void in the Seahawks locker room. After that earth-shattering news, the rest of the Seahawks offseason was as insane as it could have possibly been without the front office making any real major moves, as you had stars getting kicked out of practice left and right, literal NBA players trying out to join the Legion of Boom, and their star quarterback bragging up the constant sex he's been having. So if the Seahawks team hadn't already fallen off of a cliff, then the 2016 season would be the effective funeral for the Seahawks ever having any hopes of becoming a dynasty in the future. Instead of remaining faithful to their traditional ways of catching fire in December, the Seahawks were merely just okay throughout the season once more making the playoffs, but did so without being nearly as feared by other teams as they once were. Sadly, a lot of their defensive masters had started getting older, and their once untouchable safety duo in Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor now appeared mortal, as both players missed multiple games throughout the season as the wear and tear of playing such a punishing position was beginning to pay its toll. But as the season raged on, more and more injuries just kept piling up, as this time the Seahawks lost both sophomore receiver Tyler Lockett and now Earl Thomas for the season, continuing to fatally damage whatever exoskeleton the Seahawks still had. Regardless, the NFC was getting a little weaker at this time, and the Seahawks still found themselves in the playoffs, and after encountering a rare lion, they swiftly skinned it and made it into a carpet, moving on to the next round of the playoffs. But waiting for the Seattle Seahawks in the next round would be the Atlanta Falcons the morticians of the Seahawks' potential dynasty. Ever since Seattle won their Super Bowl, it seemed as if the spirit of Ricardo Lockett doomed the Seahawks to be nothing but a stepping stone for other teams to make or win the Super Bowl. In 2014, it was the Patriots, then the Panthers, and now here came the Falcons to deliver the finishing blow and carry on tradition. Matt Ryan, the MVP of the league, exposed the Legion of Boom, doing whatever he wanted when he wanted as the Falcons convincingly laid the Seahawks to rest. But the one moment when everyone knew this wasn't the same Seahawks team as before came near the end of the first half when the Seahawks allowed a drive that never happened before to their defense under the league. Legion of Boom. With 3 minutes and 48 seconds left on the clock, the Falcons orchestrated a 99-yard drive where they didn't call up a single run play. They threw the ball nine times, swinging the momentum in their favor eternally, showing to the NFL world that the Legion of Boom was not what it once was. The Falcons then outlasted the Seahawks offense throughout the game and sealed everything with a Russell Wilson interception and Mohamed Sanu touchdown, sending the Seahawks packing, this time in depressing fashion. And even sadder, that would be the last time that Russell Wilson and the Legion of Boom would ever be in a playoff game together. But now we enter the 2017 season where things just continue to unravel for the Seahawks. Throughout the whole regular season, the Black Death ran through the whole team and targeted the Legion of Boom in particular, as Earl Thomas got injured as usual, but this time that was not enough to satisfy the injury gods, as they came to just straight up put an end to the Legion of Boom for good. It's week 9 of the 2017 season, and the Seattle Seahawks are playing against the Arizona Cardinals on Thursday night football, and on a routine play, Richard Sherman went down and didn't get up. After the game, the Seahawks got the devastating news that Richard Sherman blew out his Achilles, and not only was he done for the season, but he would never put on a Seahawks uniform again. And I guess the Cardinals had a warlock employed during that game or something because after the Thursday night bloodbath, it turned out that Cam Chancellor also suffered a neck injury in that game, and although initially the injury was considered day-to-day, -day, not only would that be the last time Cam Chancellor would ever suit up for Seattle, but Cam Chancellor 
Bam Bam Cam, the engine of the most feared secondary in modern NFL history, would be forced to retire, as this injury, along with others he had racked up over the years, had simply become too much to bear. So although the Seahawks were still a good team at this point, their wishes of being a potential dynasty were all but dead. But that didn't stop the Cardinals from going to that grave, looting their body, and lighting the burial site on fire, turning it into nothing more than a fleeting memory. The season was a disaster, and although Russell Wilson did his job as usual, without a ferocious defense on the other side of the ball, it just wasn't enough, as the Seattle Seahawks missed the playoffs for the first time since the 2011 season. Also at this point, players were starting to admit that the interception that started their downfall hurt their team's morale a lot more than anyone initially was willing to admit, and worst of all, there was now a rift beginning to form between Russell Wilson and the rest of the team. So to start the 2018 season, things just kept falling apart as just four games into the season against once again, the cruel necromancers of Arizona on another very normal play, pretty much the last piece of the Legion of Boom secondary was executed as Earl Thomas was carted off the field with a season-ending leg fracture and he wasn't too happy with the whole situation. Instead of doing what Cam Chancellor did a few years back, Earl Thomas didn't hold out and remained out there on the field without a stable contract and very unfortunately for him, betting on himself would fail horribly in the moment, and he too would never put on a Seahawks jersey again. So with the final domino falling, the Legion of Boom was now completely dead. And the tragic part about this downfall of the Seahawks' potential dynasty is they really could have had a dynasty going for a while, because even after Earl Thomas and Richard Sherman moved on to other teams, they both recovered from their terrible injuries extremely well, and ended up becoming very important pieces to their respective teams for at least one season. And for the remaining four seasons with Russell Wilson still on the team, Russ was never able to bring the Seahawks anything close to the gold they received in 2013, and without strong voices to hold him accountable, Russell Wilson went off the handlebars bragging about his awesome post-marital sex and other shenanigans like that, but after a while, his teammates were able to basically run him out of town, and just like that, it was over. The Seattle Seahawks failed to make it back to another Super Bowl, let alone become anything even resembling a dynasty. I mean, it was really sad because this Seahawks team had everything, but due to factors like injuries, chemistry problems, mental fatigue, and football PTSD, I guess, things just didn't work out for the Seahawks. And rather than becoming an unstoppable dynasty, the Seattle Seahawks of the 2010s are looked at as nothing more than one of the greatest what-ifs in NFL history. Anyways, if you like this video, then subscribe, because I've got a lot of documentary videos like this on the channel already, and if you like this video, then watch this video right here where I went over the tragedy of Carson Wentz. It's, it's pretty good, trust me. Anyways, <sighs> until next time.